Well, I think we're here to talk about Japanese PC games and hardware and everything, and oh my gosh, we're gonna do it. Let's go. Woo! Woo! As it says, one hour lecture. Is that better? One hour lecture, there we go. Sneak peek, in case you didn't all see that before. Who here was brought by PC98 bot? Just curious. There you go. So, I'm going to do this slide in a personal introduction at the same exact time. Isn't that innovative? I got into Japanese PC things and et cetera right around back 2012. This was when I was still just getting out of high school. I'm a young person, of course. And for some odd reason, I was getting tired of looking at console games and arcade games that I was overtly familiar with. Something just felt missing. I went around the internet, so I went to places I shouldn't have gone, I went to places I'm glad to have gone. And eventually, I started to see these pictures of weird cyberpunk landscapes rendered in 640 by 400 pixels in lots of different places, on Tumblr, on 4chan, and on Twitter. I came to realize, well, there is something here. These people and these pixelated images and these spaceships didn't come out of nowhere. What I didn't realize was halfway across the world, there are people who just take this for granted. They've been surrounded by Japanese PC, memorabilia, games, culture, history, this entire time. And what's even odder is that we know so much about it, and yet the awareness gap trumps any amount of real investigation, real signal boosting, real evangelism over stateside, over even in South America, from, by and large, over in Europe, outside of the Netherlands, I'll get to that. And so, when I first came to know what Japanese PC was all about, the name, everything that came behind the term, the experiences of people who live over there, whether in Japan or Taiwan or South Korea, who were very familiar with the subject matter of today's panel, I came to just kind of boil it down to the most simple way I can describe it. They're just games on Japanese PCs, simple. But there's more to it than that always. So, go, go, go. Essentially, the goal of this panel is to point out just how much we know, but how little is ever brought up about the giant subject that is Japanese PC gaming or Japanese PC culture in the, in the same point. I call it JPC. I can't get over that intercom music, I'm sorry. But JPC is a simplified term. I don't see it very often anywhere I go, but I think it's a useful abbreviation that kind of briefly, it's a brief mnemonic to encapsulate what makes all this so interesting. I'm not here to go over things that will easily pop up on Google image searches. I'm here to take a wild dive, and re all of you on a wild dive anyway, through the heart and the history, first in a linear order and then in a kind of a popcorn order of Japanese PC culture, the games, the people who worked day and night, slept at the office to make them, and the end results and how they're interpreted after the fact. So we have creators, we also have the general trends between creators, between developers, publishers, people who went and bought these machines and actually played them and still talk about them today at meetups over there and hopefully in time to come over here. There's a lot of history behind the history. Japan was going through economic boom and then bust as we progressed through the JPC era. And I will just briefly cover how you all can get into Japanese PC games either as an enthusiast or as a potential historian as someone who appreciates just one particular part of it. All of that matters. I'm glad you're here, and the creators of these games would be glad that you will start to appreciate what they made so many years ago, and are still making to a limited degree. I'm not here to talk about collecting. Others can do that quite well. I'm not here to talk about any fetishized angle that it would be really easy to fall into when talking about games that we are hardly familiar with. The awareness gap makes it easy to assume certain things, but in truth, when you look deeper, things are always a bit more nuanced. And of course, no community drama. I know a lot of it. I'm just letting you know, I'm not going to throw that upon y'all. You are more pure than that. <laughs> Why should you care? That's Hideki Kamiya. Hideki Kamiya, on his Facebook profile, puts out, has put out a list of his favorite games from when he was a kid. He's one of the most influential generally considered influential video game designers, producers, and influencers in that industry over there. And it's critical to note that he has Japanese PC games in his favorites list. 
not simply the usual ones you might expect, but even ones such as Star Cruiser, which I'll get into, which don't immediately jog the brain as anything you'd happen to recognize. Lots of people over in East Asia, not just in Japan, grew up playing imported copies of these games however they could. Maybe they played console ports and they got to play the JPC version later, or on DOS, or on Windows later. And that proves to be you know, a considerable influence upon how they would go on to make games or create their own creative works. Of course, classic JPC history concerns so many large platforms and manufacturers and games that to not count that as part of the general you know, standardized canon of gaming history or even of electronic software history and hardware is kind of an issue. And getting right into that hopefully will raise the awareness gap. Just make it seem like, wow, why didn't we know about this earlier? And I wouldn't care if the games were not interesting. I think these games are ridiculously interesting. I hope you'll see why. Loading. Why do we have loading screens? I thought we're not on CDs anymore. Wi-Fi. We going? <laughs> well, we're waiting. <sighs> we go back and we try again. All right, that works too. Crash course and events and figures. It is a crash course. We're going to crash it right into the giants. These are the names, the logos that a lot of you might recognize. You don't recognize them in the context necessarily of gaming, outside of perhaps NEC, who are responsible for the PC Engine, the TurboGrafx-16 over here when it was localized. You might also recognize the MSX name. It's a standard of computer that proved as a way for other manufacturers to put out their own Japanese personal computers. But Fujitsu, Sharp, you might have heard of the FM Towns. You might have heard of Sharp's Nintendo TV. You, of course, have heard of Microsoft. But keep in mind, while these are giant names in many respects, the context of them making Japanese PC platforms, regulating those standards, of setting up distribution networks, all the errata that contributes to the real underpinnings of how things worked over there, that is not as well known. And I want to get into some of that. I do not, however, wish to diminish the work of the true underworks, the underdogs of the industry, who by and large existed both inside and outside the industry as they chose. Some did it as a career, working at game studios like Falcom, Koei, Konami, Seicom, HAL Laboratory. Some others were outsiders, or there were game fans who didn't necessarily seek this as a career path. Some made, well, some made Toho. That's Zune right over there in the bottom right. Others made games you've never heard about, but in their circles, a comic market, and in various other places on the Japanese internet, there is an almost legendary attachment to names like Onion Soft or Bio 100%. You might be familiar with Studio Pixel because that's the person who did Cave Story. That is also within the milieu of what I'm speaking about, a Japanese Windows game. Back in the early days, people didn't have to worry about this so much. They had breadboards, they had the solder of their own circuits from time to time. They were hobbyists, and Space Invaders wasn't even a thing, surprisingly. It took a while for such an amazing thing to come by, but until then, they had NEC TK80, the MZ80. They had these hobby kits, much akin to those that we had in the West at that point, the Altair, or uh, Ohio Computing, Ohio Science Computing. I'm skipping one. The larger point, though, is that once Space Invaders arrived, everything would change. Even major manufacturers who were simply toying with the idea of selling a PC that would function both for utility and for entertainment would eventually become the idea of the personal computer as we just take it for granted now had not crystallized. But the advent of UFO houses, these large arcades or even the small arcades that were dedicated by and large to space invaders instead of electromechanical coin ops or pinball, they pushed this idea that you could take that experience home. This would coincide, of course, with Pong TV games and similar evolutions in the model that became the consoles, the first consoles that come out in Japan, analogous to what we have over here from that same time period. But many Japanese, especially younger owners, younger buyers from 
better off families that are now enjoying the economic boom, they were spending a lot of time in UFO houses and playing the games that come just right from after that and wondering, I can take, why don't I do this for myself? Why can't I have this in the confines of a space that's not filled with cigar, cigarette smoke and I can actually hear things? So, over time, MZ series improved, and he sees PC8001 came out. And slowly, a community built of people who weren't just hobbyists working with electronics, because it's what may, matters most to them. It's a variety of people coming in to become hobbyists who still had a variety of other interests. They just knew that if they wanted Space Invaders or Immense Ilk at home, there wasn't a better option. You had to plunk down. If you couldn't plunk down, you would find the next best way. If you couldn't simply get anything, you would go find a friend who has a computer, spend time, type in some code, make a game, play a game, make it at home. Space Mouse on the right, by the way, has recently been remastered for Steam. It's telling that even going as far back as 1981, in a country where imports from the West were only just starting to trickle in, things you take for granted like the Apple II, or Commodore's early PCs like the PET, or any of that sort. At this point, the influence they had accrued from arcade games made in their own country was enough for ex early experimentation, for a huge wide array of arcade-like games to appear in magazines and zines and in various type-in listings spread throughout the subculture already developing around Japanese PC ownership. If you really could not own a PC though, there were options. You could go to a computer shop. You could just go right up to one of the demo shop PCs and start typing it in right there. You couldn't necessarily save anything, but you could try. If your shop owner was nice, you can use your floppy or your cassette tape, run it back, type it in, write it down if you need to, play back, record it, boom, you have a game. Maybe that shop person would be nice enough to look at the game, play it, and see if it's worthy for sale. There was a very grassroots feel to all this, and it generated what we would call Nikon. This takes some explanation. Micon is a portmanteau for Japanese, the Japanese version of microcomputer. To have Nikon is to have no computer. So, the Nikon tribe erupted in the early 80s, pri primarily because while you did have a lot of money rolling in from the Japanese real estate bubble, a lot of it did not simply come down, especially not for the key audience at this point in Japanese PC history. Large, uh, late teens, early 20s kids who were just rife with interest, but didn't have the capital to get into this as quickly as they would like. And so, I can say, that game right there, I have footage only because people at a forum, a collector's forum for Japanese PC hardware and software called Tokugawa Core, had found a type-in listing of Crystalsoft's Vandal for PC6001. I typed it in on an emulator, and lo and behold, this game that was very difficult to find normally it's just there like it's nothing. A Bowels Don't Like-ish game, a nice little experiment. But you could play it for hours on end if that was what you expected, that's, if that's all you had. That character right to the left is a mascot character from comics printed in Basic Magazine, an early publication, in Jap an early Jap Japanese PC publication solely dedicated to the kind of homebrew, bottom-up, learning the code mentality that the Nikon tribe really got into. It lasted for quite a while doing more than just that, but that kind of character, that kind of mentality expressed in the comic, it meant something to them that really stuck. We have to get to this one way or the other. If the term is familiar to you, good, but if the term is not familiar to you, I will explain. Galapagos syndrome is a blanket term used to describe products, particularly in Japan, which are quite well advanced technically, but do not match the specification or the standardization found in other countries across the West, across the Americas, across Europe, and even other parts of Asia. But it's not solely a phenomenon exclusive to Japan. It is a blanket term first used in that context. It can apply to many different countries, many different cultures that, ex ex that yeah. Point is, that is the NEC APC right up there. That is a PC-88, released in America, also released in South America, bought over in limited supply to various different markets that NEC was interested in. But it didn't sell well. There was poor localization for its software. The its hardware quirks were unadapted to the expectations of users outside Japan. 
and support in terms of logistics for NEC was difficult. If you're transporting necessary software and technical support halfway across the world, even with your own branch in the test market, you're going to have a lot of lag between customer reports, between distributor information, and so on, that makes it difficult to really get a footing. This is something that Commodore and Sinclair and other manufacturers from other countries also had to deal with. But the barrier between Japanese major manufacturers like NEC, Fujitsu, and Sharp was just too big, by and large, outside of the MSX standard, which we'll get to in a bit. And that's a trickier situation. Right there, in fact, there is an MSX magazine cover from the Netherlands. It is from the late 80s, right when they were getting in the first MSX-1 and the soon MSX-2 model computers, and they started experimenting and making their own homebrew clubs. And to the right, I just put that there for fun. It is a ridiculous ad, the like of which you will see commonly as you trawl through Google Image looking at old ads for even older Japanese PCs. Loading again. Is that what I wanted? That is what I wanted. So, we have some video right here. Let's take a look. This is what you can expect from 1984. If I'm not mistaken. This was the Black Onyx, the first major first-person dungeon crawler to be made in Japan. Ironically, led by a non-Japanese person, Hank Rogers, who you might know as the person who produced, crew to produce the Tetris series. A very simple looking game, but a critical one in that you're already starting to see Western imports such as wizardry and Wizardry, Ultima, and the sort start to influence the kind of games that are considered acceptable to really try out and promote to Japanese PC users. Ooh, cracking. And then from 1986, you get something altogether a bit different. Thanks, YouTube. Well, oh well. A larger point to be made in the middle of this, however, is that while all these wonderful people are making these wonderful programs for these wonderful type in magazine listings and starting to buy the first commercial, widely commercial Japanese PC games for PC8001 and for PC6001 and for the Sharp X1, even the earliest PC88 or PC98 models or Fujitsu FM7, I could go on. The crash that we, the crash is that we affected by and large the United States of America, Europe and other adjacent markets for video games at that point, whether talking about arcade games, about console games, about to an extent, a small extent, microcomputer games. Japan did not really exactly worry about that. They were not unaffected, but they were affected so marginally that people deeply involved in the Japanese PC scene at the time weren't worried about this. They were making increasingly innovative games that pushed the limits of what they could do with these machines, which in some respects were both overpowered and underpowered. If we were to take a look at this again, the resolution on this game's the, this game's resolution is 640 by 400. The average resolution for a Western PC at this point, screen resolution, would be all around half that size, maybe even smaller. But the games don't move fast. The MSX standard, for example, has sprites, but the PC-88, this game's on the PC-88, doesn't. These machines were designed with a kind of catch-all mentality outside of certain examples like Sharp's PCs. You don't have to have built-in support for advanced video graphics, but you do have to have expandability. You don't have to have the absolute best gear in the first place, but if you have a nice sound chip, people are gonna listen to that in the shop. All these little things factored in and got people's attention more so than necessarily the most graphically advanced item that you could put out if you were a manufacturer. This stands in stark contrast to all the goals that Nintendo's Famicom family computer took immediately trying to transfer the fidelity of the arcade experience as best as they could to a home TV screen. Whereas things were a bit more lax on the JPZ side. This is also the first age of adventure games. I should just say it, Mystery House by Sierra Online started the Japanese adventure game. It's a little hard to believe. But for a while, Japanese PC developers like Micro Cabin, like Square, Square right there, second from right, Will, the Death Trap 2, 
were deeply involved in making the first graphic text adventure games. And soon, they found themselves making the first command selection based adventure game. Some of these screens might ring a bit familiar. Who recognizes Hydelight at the bottom left? That's right. People tend to drag on Hydelight. I don't think that's exactly warranted because they played an iffy port to the Famicom, to the NES. To be fair though, Hydelight is basically Tower Draga with a world map, which is even weirder until you know what Tower Draga is like. Back in the day, Adventure games, early RPGs, the very earliest Japanese RPGs, like the ones founded at Koei, or Falcom, or T and Esof, the makers of Hydelight, they would take it for granted that people would be sharing notes with each other. All these notes collected would form a way to actually complete the game, and this was a game in and of itself. The concept arguably came to its fruition when people started playing Namco's Tower of Draga back in 1984. It was a very obscure, difficult to understand dungeon crawling game that constantly puzzled people until they realized they could just write down a little notebook right by the arcade cab exactly how they can beat it. What are the secrets like? How does this thing work? What is this enemy going to do if around the corner? The same applies to Hydelight. Arguably not as much given that developers knew people would be playing at home solitary for a considerable amount of time. But that didn't stop hint books, magazine tips, and other means of transmitting knowledge about how to properly experience all that money you just spent, upwards of 7,800 yen or more, just to feel like you didn't lose your money's worth. On the right, you also see the advent of increasingly advanced visuals on these machines. Not necessarily more fluid visuals, but more impressive. This was the era of Japanese bubble money coming in and saying, you can do crazy, crazy, crazy stuff because we're investors who don't know what we're doing, but if you put that nice Scroll up on the screen, people will buy it in the shop, and they did. This is right around the time, of course, when erotic games start to come to Japanese PC platforms. And if you all were here for Japanese erotic games, I'm so sorry. I'm just, I'm not for that, but I will recognize this is where you start to get some of that. Not here, of course. Earth Fighter Reiza, Reiza is an early 1986 JRPG. I prefer to call them adventure war games, but that's a different panel. Point is, you have portraits, you have detailed menu options, you have statistics, you have things that simply were taken kind of under the hood. They weren't displayed in these kinds of games and these types of genres up until the point that you could figure out how to place them against very nice looking anime images. Still, the Famicom was becoming very successful at this point. Thankfully, some games still looked pretty good and played really well, even when they didn't match the general advantages of any of these PCs. This is a shooter for the X, Sharp X1. The Sharp X1 has a very limited sprite functionality. This performs very quick. It's a good shooter. I like Boomer. Will this actually run? It runs. And in 1986, a game that almost came to the Famicom, but didn't, fortunately, tended to happen back then, came out from an unassuming developer named Systemsoft. They're known these days for war games, but back then, they could get away with doing a, very, a big variety of genres. Such as the first Dota game! It's true. You play Dota. It's his first game. But the crazy thing is... These games stack up quite well to what came out in the Famicom of the period. Also, the Epoch Super Confession Division, even the Master System. Granted, it's a bit slow. And so you gotta figure out what to do. It's a dungeon crawling platformer. This precedes Apogee platformers from the DOS years. It precedes Dota, of course. I'm gonna milk that joke for all it's worth because I got nothing else for this slide. I've got more video. Catchy. If you do ever get the chance to play on a PC-88, and I'm sorely annoyed that Dave over here couldn't get his PC-88 set working for Backfest this year, Bokken Roman is the kind of game that you can show off to your friends and say, you know, it ain't all like that. It ain't just anime titty. It's actual real stuff. At least, I think it's real. Let's move on. There's an important figure at this point that we have to talk about. Aski's Kazunori Nishi was 
a sort of magnate for Japanese PC hobbyists in the late 70s and early 80s. He is on the left here, that is a young Bill Gates on the right. In the late 70s, Nishi and Gates made a partnership, and it led to the MSX platform, Microsoft Extended Platform. Nishi had grand ideas about what the future of Japanese PC engagement, ownership, accessibility, and usage could be. He helped co-found ASCII Corporation, which started as simply a publication, but then grew to have many branches, almost becoming the Katakawa Corporation equivalent for Japanese electronics, consumer electronics, and personal computing. The MSX standard, he shopped out to multiple people until he finally managed to convince Skates and his cadre that this could work, they could sell this to multiple manufacturers, and so the MSX-1 was born, coming out largely in 1982 and 1983 from various manufacturers. Toshiba, Panasonic, al Anaya, and Saudi Arabia, they had all, they hadn't all, but Toshiba and Panasonic in particular had tried to break into the market, already congested with different platforms, different ecosystems, different subcultures who, by, by and large, already had a kind of brand following. Some people preferred NEC or Fujitsu or Sharp or MSX now. And Toshiba and Panasonic's previous efforts were eclipsed by the MSX models they could sell. The MSX has a reputation for being kind of the Western known Japanese PC computer. Some people wonder still if it's a console or a computer or a hybrid. I consider it a computer, but it's telling that so many people ask the question. Nishi wanted to kind of blend the barrier, the borderline between what is simply a microcomputer for hobbyists? What is something the whole family can use? The MSX, with its cartridge slots, but also its expandability and its improved visual capabilities, seeks to bridge that gap. You get what we could call a little golden age. This is a little thing that I think is real anyway. Starting in 1986 and 1989, you get what you could call the first peaks of Japanese PC software. These are the games that, by and large, got localized in the West for DOS. Games such as Thexter, Zelliard, Murder Club, Sierra, brought, Sierra Online brought those over, for example. Sorcerian, right here, also a Sierra Online localization. None of them are here. On the left, top left, where is my cursor? Cursor, get over there. We have a game for the PC-88VA. This was a period also when these manufacturers are, were attempting to create their own kind of console generation leap. I'm not super hot on console generations as a way of measuring the distance between you know, one set of platforms coming out and another set with a whole different context. But FM77AV, PC88VA, X1 Turbo Z, all these were expanded models. They were targeted towards current owners or prospective owners who want to upgrade, who want to future-proof themselves. And as it turned out, they didn't catch on in the slightest. The FM 77 AV is not pictured here, but this 88 VA game, nice as it looks, was one of only 10 or 15 to ever come out for the system. It was a niche experiment that just did not pan out. After all, you could play a game like this on six or seven platforms already, and they all looked, sorry, they all looked pretty much the same. So, if you're gonna spend upwards of more than $1,000 in Japanese yen equivalent at the time, to buy a mere, a good upgrade, but one that's not gonna get you to play more games, then what are you going to do? You're going to stick with the current platform. You get games instead that push the boundaries. You get one of the earliest RDS war games with Silver Ghost. You get on new systems, you get games that actually do push the boundaries and aren't shackled to the previous expectations for the PC-88 or the Sharp X1. It sounds nice. You get the earliest 3D polygonal games of, of note. Primitive as this was in 1989, it kind of made waves. And you all sound like Blockhead, I know. We'll talk about that game more later. I'll just say that game is one of Kamiya's favorites. Going back to the previous slide. Let's see if this one will actually play. On the other hand, you did have some janky games. There is a joy to this, but it is the kind of joy analogous to uh, putting yourself at a rave without earplugs. How about that? Exactly. 
And that's enough for that. You know, to be honest, I actually like that version of Alice the very first, but yeah, when you get to that stage, I want to get past it as soon as I can. Of course, at this point, most of these developers were not making Arrow gay. They were not explicitly tuning themselves to the expectations of otaku players who would buy anything, no matter how bad, just because it fit their brand, their image, the thing that they find, no matter the, no matter the quality. So you get a lot of experiments. You get games like Silver Ghost, games like Star Cruiser, weird acid trips like Valis. And they all had a valid place. There were publications coming out already, like Beymaga, like Beep, like CompTIC, all these mag like Technopolis magazines that were showcasing not just the experiments from the commercial side, the games that looked nice and were doing weird stuff as well, but also Dojin games as they were finally making their break onto Comicat out into the general market of resale. It was a great time. Falcom had its great successes during this period with Ys and Sorcerian. Sorcerian. Telnet made games like Ballas. The earliest PC to console ports were happening during this period. Games like Woody Poco or Xanadu, Fox Xanadu, were coming to the Famicom and to the NES. And the Master System. It was a great period, but we also have some rather iffy looking things in this period. I don't know if that shows up very well at all. That's better. You get one game on many platforms and it just, ah. I should explain the description of the premise of this game. You're playing a truck carrying a series of highly explosive bombs. You must not have your truck destroyed because you are taking this away from a group of terrorists, according to the manual. And it is imperative that you make it to the enemy stage without uh, taking particularly large damage or running out low on fuel. This is Telnet before Telnet became known as the origins of Idea Factory, of the Tales of series, and other weird stuff. Of course, by the late 80s, you go away from the PC-88, the Sharp X1, the Fujitsu FM7, all their upgraded variants, all the PC-6001s, and other microcomputers, and the MSX1s, to more familiar models. You have the MSX2, now the MSX Turbo R down here. You had the MSX2 as well, which upgraded visuals. But then you also have better models of the PC-98. So far, the PC-98, which you might be a little familiar with, name recognition, has not been a huge factor but now it's becoming one as the late 80s saw improved visuals, improved compatibility with the kinds of games that developers were making and an urge to get away from the PC-88 as it became more of an evergreen, uh, less new and more antiquated platform. You get two super workstation tier computers, the Sharp X6800 with its twin towers design and proprietary CRT and the, Sharp and the Fujitsu FM Towns which also came out during this period before becoming later better known as the FM Towns Marty on console form. And both of these have their perks. The X68000 was powerful enough to become a workstation for Capcom's own arcade game development, among other feats. And the FM Towns had a lot of use for educational purposes, for lots of federal funded purposes. Fujitsu had deep ties lobbying for the Japanese federal government at this point and could get their tendrils in many different places. There are reasons for that. Fujitsu used to sell the most word processors out of anyone in the late 70s. They were doing really, really well until NEC came along and said no. And it came with a CD-ROM built in, a CD-ROM player reader that could read and write. This was a very early example of a machine coming equipped for multimedia games that would start to proliferate throughout the early and middle 90s before hitting a glut, as I'll discuss later. However, the bubble crashed around this point. The real estate bubble and subsequent huge amount of investment into various different industries by people who didn't have any clue how to handle the money they got from shares, it started to fall apart in slow motion, culminating in the early 1990s. And this started to affect, in a small part, developers in Japan and also publishers who relied on games that only sold small margins. And so some of the studios that were just struggling on an edge right at that point they finally tanked as part of the market was getting chopped up by Falcom, by Konami, by the high tier developers, those who had a lot of exposure, who had very good reviews, who had a great reputation, started to get the majority of sales. You start to see the move away from making a good living off of your dinky little arcade puzzle game to having to make a big blockbuster budget adventure game. 
that hurt a lot of studios. Unless you're on MSX and MSX2, things were a bit different, you could still get away with that to a certain degree. There were still big developers making games explicitly for that machine or porting to it. But there was still a great accessibility range for anyone still trying to get out, get in, and make the game of their dreams that would also give them a nice penny. Things start to change right around 1989. That's when Aerogay becomes big. Aerogay was a thing starting in the early 80s. There were early examples of games catered towards the unfortunate Lolicon otaku. There were games that were already pushing the barriers of what you could show on screen with nudity, even from Koei's own GRPGs early on, which is an interesting subject in its own right. But on the right, you see Dragon Knights for the PC-88, one of the illustrious Aerogay publisher Elf's first breakout hits. It, in turn, became a big standard for what these games would be like. You would have a kind of, you know, there was a plot, there was a story, there was a backstory, yes. But people were buying it because cute girls and sex. And you couldn't get that on console. Nintendo, Sega, and other manufacturers were careful enough to vet the kinds of games, by and large, which go through and gets, you know, they get completed and then they're ready for publication. Well, they had quality standards. NEC, Fujitsu Sharp, the others, they didn't care that much. That was on the shops. They could delegate all of that self-censorship, which isn't really self-censorship anyway, it's just market decisions, to the shops, to the people actually running magazines and getting the word out. And of course, when there aren't that kind of, no such regulations, you get this. This isn't necessarily that bad, but it starts to become a thing that by and large takes over and becomes hard to ignore. I see people turned away from looking at Japanese PC games of this vintage simply because, oh, oh, ah, uh, what? You, you sure there's something else worth looking at here? I don't want to look at that in public. I mean, neither would they, but they went to the shops in public. You also get the Sim games going mainstream. To expound on that, this is Take the H Train 3 in the bottom left. It is a kind of middle ground between Transport Tycoon, that would come later, or Railroad Tycoon, and SimCity, except that this came out before SimCity. And Railroad, not, no, it, didn't, it came after SimCity, it came out before Railroad Tycoon. You have city building, you have economic sims, you have war games starting to become very notable as people start to adopt if not the newest models, then at least used older models a machine that can still play ports of the newer games to those machines. The PC-88 was, was evergreen for quite a while, up until the early, early 90s. So you could play Super Dice and Ryaku, Super Great War, on an early machine, and then upgrade when the time came. Systemsoft, Artdink, Kogato, these are names associated in Japan quite highly with strategy games, with war games, with raising games. Princess Maker 2, if anyone has ever heard of that, came from this era. And of course, set a lot of standards for raising sims that would come later. You see the inception of the visual novel coming from Aerogay, which itself synthesized with the earlier command-based tech graphic adventure games built by, well, really pioneered first by Yushi Hori. If we go back to that slide, because I skipped it, foolishly, this is not some insignificant game right up here. This is Portopia's serial murder case. It came out in 1983, and it got a Famicom port much later, which has been since fan translated. And it defines the, the general framework of graphic text event, graphic command-based adventure games coming out on Japanese PCs from that point forward. Yushi Hori is most known these days as being the Dragon Quest person. He's Mr. Dragon Quest. He came up with it. He managed to design the whole thing by himself. He, got, he did not do the programming or the art, but he did the very core of the idea of Dragon Quest, where we get the modern idea of what a JRPG at the most minimum can be. But I still think this is more influential, because from this, you get games like this. And going forward, in fact, you do get games like this. They use the same command-based interface. You're not typing in to a text prompter how you want to play, you're taking the predefined options because, oh gosh, if you tried typing Japanese into a, a text prompter and having it work, I have, it's not good. There were English, there were English only Japanese text adventure games at this point because coding wise, it was much easier to make a text, have a text interpreter read English than Japanese characters. It should go without saying that if your computer could not adequately render Japanese kanji or any special characters, 
then it was not going to be used. And that defines a lot of the games from this period. Before I go on, let's play a bit of this. The music in this game is by Yuzo Koshiro. The game itself, it's typical of these middle budget dungeon crawlers from the period. It just happens to sound particularly good. You walk up to this and you're thinking, oh, well, it didn't look super great at a distance, but now I can hear it and I want to try it for some reason. It almost looks like Populous. The isometric angle, the framing, the bordering around the play area. But it is a hardcore dungeon crawler, inspired by the likes of Rogue and other similar games, albeit not randomly generated. There's a difference. So, you start to get, oh, I don't like this projector very much, but anyway, you start to get a little Silver Age. You get an age of refinement. You get an age where it's taken for granted that erotic games are here to stay. They have become the majority of games on the PC-98. That's true. Anyone looking at PC-98 bot on Twitter would know this. But, you still had experiments. Just, they were safer. At this point, there was a clear idea based on custom feedback, based on what has destroyed studios in the past and what has made them super successful, what kinds of genres succeed on this platform, what kind of games will actually do well according to these publications, what really kind of has an underground following. You get city builders on the top right. This is Art Dink's Tokyo right here, set in an O'Neill space cylinder orbiting Earth and you have to manage your own little city up there. Very cool idea. You have Azure on the FM Towns right over here, a scrolling Mix of rail shooting and dungeon crawling, largely rail shooter, that shows off the machine's capabilities. You have a Dojin game on the Sharp X68000 right here. It looks pretty nice. That's just a mini game, one part of it. You have even the rare action game on the PC-98 right at the bottom right. It looks choppy because it's loading a lot of GIFs. But people were still pushing the limits of machines that did not have sprites, did not have scrolling software, and then so forth. It's also worth pointing out, if we go back a slide, that this artwork right here was not done by pixel by pixel. Some people have this idea that PC-98 games, especially the ones that look really pretty, were some masterwork of incredible miniature craft work. Not, I mean, they were, but not necessarily. This was scanned in from a drawing or a series of cells, and then they had, the programmers had to figure out how is this going to work with only 16 colors, let alone eight, if earlier. They found ways. They found new, they made new algorithms to make dithering better, faster, more applicable to the kinds of games they're making, especially Aerogay en masse. Other developers such as Falcom, again, but also Glodia, Konami, and others figured out ways that they could make really ambitious artistic achievements on these machines, despite the lack of the graphics capabilities that you would need. PC-98, Steam rolls right ahead of the Sharp X6800, right ahead of the FM Towns, right ahead of any MSX still straggling by. It is by far, at this point, the market leader, and it stays that way up through the late 90s. And that applies to all this right here. As nice as these games are, as nice as this looks and this looks and this looks, it's this game right up here, Tokyo, that probably sold more. And to be fair, it looks really good in its own way, but it plays slow and it has the usual uh, accoutrements of PC-98 games. This lasted for quite a while, and then you get to what we could call a twilight period for Japanese PC gaming. Right as we started to have better, more applicable access as a public to the internet, more ability to actually see what's going on around the world in real time, so too did Japanese PC gaming go by the wayside. There are a number of reasons why this happened. It wasn't a simple crash. It was more like a slow decline that finally gained took water and sunk the whole ship. But typical of this period was the switch to Wintel PCs, window, uh, Intel-based Windows running PCs that did not meet the NEC PC-98 specification. NEC had previously formed a stranglehold on this market of sorts, and they were also making inroads with consoles using the PC engine and its variants. But when Windows, finally, Windows 95 in particular came out, uh, the machines that could easily run it were not PC-98s. They were new imports from Compaq and other manufacturers finally breaking over the barriers of localization and logistics to get overseas. And so you end up with 
games finally go into Windows. This is Tsukihime, a visual novel for Windows 95, right here from the 2000s. That became more of the kind of game that the niche hobbyist would expect to buy or really get into. You have on the left right here, Ground Sea for PC-98, a fusion of RPG and visual novel, right as that was starting to become a viable genre or style of game for a lot of developers back in the period. You have on the bottom left, A-Train 5, Art Dink, the sign in to go 3D. At this point, Windows developers, or developers transitioning to Windows, rather than going for ports to console via the behest and support of Sony and Sega, stuck with Windows and decided to try graphics accelerated games such as this. This runs on Power VR, this game right here. It's very hard to play because of that. Power VR cards are not easily found or supported on any modern operating system. They weren't even that good back then. And then you have games which are, uh, can I get full screen please? Come on boy. I believe I can, oh, it's right there, it's right there. Then you get games that are explicitly taken after Western influences that came in much later. This is an isometric action RPG. It is actually a sequel to Relics right over here, but contrary to the side-scrolling action of that game, instead, you get something more akin to this. You shapeshift and take control of different bodies to get through a series of dungeons, exploring an increasingly mysterious setup, backstory, and world itself. This was not something that came out of the blue, an original idea that anyone particularly had. It is a logical conclusion of Relics, but it is also heavily indebted Oh, look at it go, look at it go. Whee. Heavily indebted to a number of games coming out of Korea. This is where things start to get even more interesting because Korea was very familiar with Western PC games at this point. They did not have particularly successful Japanese PC machine imports. They stuck with DOS running machines and the transition to Windows was quite natural for them. They were a burgeoning market and many people wanted to play games as South Korea was coming out of a rather oppressive authoritarian administration. With the increase of conspicuous and consumption over there, people started to play more arcade games, but also started to go to internet cafes. And even before then, people were adopting DOS gaming PCs for the home, for the school, and so forth, that allowed kids and young adults to get into a variety of interesting things. You skip a bit, and you start to see games that are clearly taken after Western RDSs, Warcraft, your Starcraft, Dune, Command and Conquer but also games that are taking influence from Japanese RPGs, for instance, among others, shooters, action games. Oh, if I go over here, yeah, we'll get to that in a second, but. You get games such as Arcturus, which is increasing the work for me, full screen, but these games in particular, show what you could do in early 3D graphics accelerated hardware back in a country where it was rather out of the blue to suddenly play a dense story rich JRPG as if it came from Japan itself. And this went both ways. It does go both ways once we get back to loading this. Part of the triumvirate of East Asian PC gaming though are games coming out of Taiwan. A lot of the information we have on Taiwanese PC developers, their games and products, the importing and exporting between them in South Korea and Japan is rather hard to pin down. Just finding online sources or even archival sources of notes has been difficult, let alone getting game copies that actually work. By and large, these games have become abandonware. They're abandoned by their own developers who have, just like South Korean developers, moved on to MMORPGs and similar online games, living games, that have become in vogue as of late. But you still get the occasional game from back in this day that took influence from import peers, and which are pretty hard to read if you only speak English, of course. And this game was, in this game, Holy Eye in particular, was only recently uh, unearthed from a series of technical hurdles involved with playing games on emulated virtualized Windows hardware and operating systems. Many of these Chinese 
and Korean games took more increase, just as much as Japanese PC games did their best to make games based on premises, based on local mythology, history, and culture as well. Holy Island shows its roots in Chinese wuxia fiction quite noticeably with these fictionalized borderlands, you know, way back in the day Chinese settings. But in the meantime, you have fictional fantasy settings with Western influences, like from Seventh Seal. Taiwanese developers also stick, stuck mostly to DOS and Windows, as was typical for the time. Towards the late 90s, as developers and publishers were trying, struggling to keep up with imports coming from basically everywhere, they found ways to adapt. You have game developers like TGL going in, Japanese developers going in on the RDS craze of the late 90s. You have Grand developers, grand developers from Taiwan, like Softstar, importing Western isometric action titles and making their own. You have an MMORPG right here from ArtDink, Lunatic Dawn 4, building upon previous games in the series, taking that open-ended nature of the single-player game, but making it multiplayer. You have all these things, but in the meantime, you have largely a focus on software over hardware. At this point, the unique level of hardware and peripherals, the variety and breadth of them starts to diminish a lot as developers and publishers can only afford to focus on niche subcultures in otaku who can bankroll them, keep them afloat. Even Falcom suffered this, so much so that people left Falcom. People left companies like Falcom, of course, all the time, but more so now that they could start their own company and just make a break for it, try and get a foothold while they still can before they have to move on to another industry. People burn out all the time, but sometimes they do startups, like Group 01. We have a game from ex-Falcon personnel on the left. We have, doing swimmingly this entire time, compile of Eleste, Puyo Puyo fame, and many other things. But they were doing PC games for a long time. This is Wonder Wonder for Windows 95 by Compile, for instance. Just running around town, Games back then, in the, late, in the early Windows days, you couldn't always expect them to be in 3D. So it was still profitable and expected to focus on low-tech, but replayable and memorable titles like this one. Compile also was a pioneer of subscription-based gaming. Even on the, old, on the earliest JPC platforms they were working on, when they made a ton of MSX games, they quickly transitioned over to the disk station model. They would put out every month, every year, a series, a disk station floppy, which would contain mini games, small games, serial games, lots of collectible artwork, music, a whole little Zine equivalent from a company that has just not had this reputation for doing such things over in the West. Compile also managed to overexpand towards the early 2000s and drew, uh, drew themselves into a financial pitfall. Their their Collapse was very sudden and very nasty. On that note, we can start talking about a little copper age. With the turn of the millennium, you start to get games that just don't really appear over here at all until arguably the 2010s, the late 2000s, last decade, when localization companies over here realize, wait, there's all this. What's all this been doing here? And that gets you, well, it gets you east in 3D. It does not get you this. Instead, they get this. They get to keep their war games. This is Kogado's Power Dolls 4, long line, the, one of the later installments in a long line running series of mecha action based war games. And eventually you do get games from Koei like Nobunaga's Ambition. At this point, Koei had earned its reputation for Musou games, Dynasty Warriors, and it's like, hey, guys, they've been doing war games and RPGs for forever. And now, you get to play it on Steam, finally. And you were able to do that back on various console ports brought over back in the day, but it was fragmented in a way that isn't the case anymore. However, from our perspective, we're not able to see the less hidden, unknown, and rather underloved games that came out there in this period for Windows or Dojin games that started coming out more and more for the MSX and other retro platforms of this era and this context. You also see Korean and Taiwanese developers fully abandon 
almost fully abandoned single player games in favor of multiplayer online to better fit the internet cafe focused culture of those countries. You get a wide diaspora of software from across these three countries and I thought it was important to show off games from Sing uh, not Singapore, South Korea and Japan, South Korea and Taiwan because they all have a kind of triangular influence on each other. You have strategy RPGs on the left. You have, if I can jump right to it. <clears throat> loaded, loaded. You have games like Space Griffin, which is not showing up well in this at all. Oh my gosh. It's a first person dungeon calling game where you play a mech pilot. You get action games like Asher Counter of Crescents that actually get fan translations. Fan translation for Japanese PC games, but also games from Korea and Taiwan, are progressing at a slow but steady pace. There are more groups working on them now. There's better util there are better utilities to actually hack into the games, make them prepared for these fan translations. As interest grows, and I hope this panel contributes to that, that's going to increase a lot more. I have a big selection of bookmarks. I never quite explained just how many bookmarks I have. It'd be difficult to explain, but I have at least 2,000 plus bookmarks just of me going through Japanese fan sites, going through wiki articles of the other language, and so on, desperately trying to archive this information before it goes away. They're all too aware of this themselves, at least as enthusiasts. Right here is PC88 Game World by Enyaro, I believe. Might be someone else, but it was a Dojin CD cataloging the most thorough look at PCA games anyone ever put together by the turn of the millennium. That got put on the internet eventually, and eventually was archived by the Game Preservation Society in Tokyo. They were doing a lot of important work in making sure these games and the media surrounding them are extant, of course. But history accessible to us, history accessible to the layman who has some interest in this, the fan who wants to know more about that publisher who had a past in this. It is hard to get that information and even harder to make it relevant and viable for people just wandering in through the door. So at this point, I want to get into some interesting stories. I have, it looks like, what, about 15 more minutes. So let's scramble through. This person right here created co-founded Technosoft and created Thunder Force, that Thunder Force. But she had a tumultuous past of her own, struggling with years of gender dysphoria as she pushed herself to become one of the greatest programmers in all of Japan. And this is largely the case. This game right here, as I show more of it, doesn't seem to stand out. However, it has its own built-in operating system that runs contiguous with the game. It is an adventure game much akin to King's Quest from the same period, albeit with a different perspective and a command-based selection instead. Even before then, you have games look like this. This is Sharp X1's version of Thunder Force. Little Dinky, plays better than it looks. Especially when you get to these parts where it starts to tear up the screen. But it plays fast and it plays well. A mixture between Xevious, Time Pilot, and Bosconian from that period. All these influences going into a blender. You see the variety of games coming from someone who started in the early 80s making games as a Nikon producer, eventually becoming a commercial, mag a commercial someone. Will that exit me from the presentation or will that give me? No. Maybe I can move this finally. Nope. You get three games like Star Cruiser that push the limits of what was possible for a Japanese adventure slash first person shooter slash space sim slash. Uh, this is the one I really wish. Come on, boy. Here we go. Because you have all this, and you have all of this. But you also, you also have spacefaring. Once you get out of this part, anyway. You get to go over a whole galaxy. You have all these incredible things. And you have the context of amateur sci-fi pulp story behind all of this. Kei Yoshimura was a big fan of Star Trek, especially the Star Trek mainframe game. All these things kind of came together, really formed the canon of what she considered hip. These days, she works mostly as a contract programmer, but has recently got a lot of attention for trying to make a new spiritual successor to Star Cruiser. 
it's important that while we recognize all the things that surround these creators, all the people who helped make these games and helped form these studios and help get these games to market, there are still exemplary people behind these games we seemingly don't have much knowledge about. And it's a darn shame when that's just not publicly available knowledge, or not so much publicly available, but not publicly relevant. This is where many Japanese video game musicians broke themselves in. You have Yuzuka Shira on left, but if I go over here, you have playing now, Hitoshi Sakimoto. It's not exactly well known, but Hitoshi Sakimoto started out programming for these games, programming music drivers, helping with critical development. He was an outsider before he became more of an insider. But in general, the inclusion of FM synth sound chips in the PC-88 and its competitors drove forward a niche, a niche but powerful interest in chiptune music. What would seem just as an equivalence to the most, the closest equivalence to the kind of orchestral sound you'd want to hear from these kinds of games grew into its kind of, grew to have an appreciation in its own right. Modern chiptune artists like Halley, for instance, who runs the Egg Music label on D4 Enterprises focusing on Japanese PC game soundtracks would cite these early soundtracks as incredibly influential. It gets you excited. I hate to stop it. Unfortunately, the composer of that tune, Ryu Yumimoto, passed away quite a while ago. There was a good expose about his life's work, about his personality, his philosophy, and how he made his music up and around the internet. He made music for Eroge. If you really truly didn't have an interest in any of the actual erotic stuff, you could at least enjoy the soundtrack. I will get to questions in just a bit. We have a few more stories to go right through. You get the curious case of Mark Flint. You get this strange... Western sounding programmer who does awfully impressive work. Let's take a look. This is from 1985. System Seikon was only a hardware manufacturer at this point, making soundboards and disc peripherals and various other things that might help you as an owner. However, they needed to have games to sell their stuff. They figured people, like, people in Japan like English, but they especially like it when it's someone with mystique. Eventually, you get games on machines that cannot run this well. It's a little static fuzz. For a machine that cannot do scrolling or sprites or anything that impressive, this game looks better than anything in the Famicom in 1985. It's almost more akin to a demo you'd expect from the demo scene, but here it's used for a commercial purpose, albeit obliquely. Mark Flint was a name attached to all of these games, supposedly the sole proprietor, the creator, the programmer. Show you a bit more of this before we move on. Boop, boop. You get some Starfield stuff. You get whatever those things are. You get things that just don't make any sense for the PC-98 before it was even as advanced as the PC-88. But the larger point I want to make here is that we still don't know who Mark Flint is. I have a clue who this person might be. Looking at various blogs and fan sites, people have pieced together the name Ushio Osamu, which might be connected, but it's only one theory. They might have been a collection of programmers working at the same department in System Seicom who would go on to collaborate and make these incredible tech demos a reality. There are still many mysteries hidden behind a lack of primary sources, behind a lack of easy access to archival sources over in Japan that might elucidate what's going on here. The point is, that game is weird, but it's even weirder how well it performs. And we don't know who did it. Meanwhile, in 1995, Japan's first MMORPG happened. And you never heard of it. Because it only served 100 people, it came out five days before Meridian 95, and it didn't last more than a few years. We still can't get easy access to it, because as a living game with its online community now dispersed, and the servers now offline, it's something of a lost cause. But a JRPG-style MMO with BBS-style connection, essentially a game you could play on dial-up when you were cooked in with your friends and you are having an online community, it came out at just the right period for fan sites to exactly cover in depth what this was all like, who the characters people were coming up with, 
the kinds of experiences that people were having in these overworlds and dungeons, crawling and having a fun time of themselves. This was on PC-98, another place with a huge install base. Even as Windows was expanding at this point, people still stuck to games on the PC-98 like this, for good reason. There were plenty of surprises. And there was a lot of history made in the process just from people sharing the kinds of, the kind of sub, making a subculture for themselves, having a following, being the people who play Exclusion, and knowing each other well, awfully well, in a time before, a time when you could still talk to each other mainly on bolt and board services, or via teletype, or via early internet forums. It's around this point that 2chan and its image board variants start to crop up in various places around the Japanese internet, that people have guest books that they type comments into, remember those? Web 1.0. And games like Exclusion played an important point, part in making that relevant, letting people say, you know, it's not easy to talk in game or even over the phone. We can't do it over the phone, we're using the phone for the game, but we can do it asynchronously. You have edutainment games from this period. We can't forget those, especially the weirdest ones possible. Let's take a look. But they weren't weird without reason. It's reading the flopping. Here's 2chan. But here's the game. It doesn't look like much, doesn't it? If we go a bit forward, however, we'll start to see some really interesting things. We start to see psychedelic landscapes. We start to see a real adventure coming up. What's it about? Well, it's actually about, it's, it's teaching you how to play, but it's about touch typing. It's teaching you to touch type, making you play through an earthbound-esque psychedelic JRPG. What's especially unique, however, is how much it wants you to use this book that's not a box, that's not a box for the game. It's a spine, label, cover, back, it's a book. And it's almost a hint book, but also a necessary thing that Michiaki Subaki intended for people to read as they played through the games. He wasn't interested in easily taught subjects. He was interested in putting you, your avatar, down into the midst of an, integ an integrated circuit in a J Japanese PC and trying to figure out your way to escape by using assembly language code to defeat monsters. And it has a cult following. There was actually a drive many years ago to reprint these books for each of these games, even the one with the game that has Alien World Trees. And while his name has kind of disappeared into the annals, you could say, the effect that this had in the industry has not. Many people got their first exposure to the FM Towns, for instance, because, or the, even in Japan, the Macintosh, because sort of Kumdor. The game I just showed you, the touch typing trainer set in psychedelic land, got a lot of exposure in schools and in community centers. So there were games made not, made not just for gaming enthusiasts and hobbyists, those who experiment with tech, but also people who were just doing this to learn, who were just doing this for a practical purpose, for utility, who would otherwise be playing on console. They would just take it for granted, oh, this is the Kumdor computer, or something similar. All right. And that brings us to Q&A. So, we have about f 10 or 15 more minutes. And you can, there's only one mic working right now, but it's a small enough room, you can shout it out. So, just raise your hands if you want to ask me anything. You in the back, right there. What would you say the difference by common um, Japanese PC is like two to one? Okay. The question was, what, we, what do I consider the most iconic Japanese PC game to be? Toho. Without question, the Toho games on Windows, even on PC-98, have a massive following. I felt it was a bit obligatory to not have to worry about people knowing Toho. Toho is a series of bullet hell style shooting games that come out, came out first for 98 and then for Windows. And they have a large following, not necessarily because they're great games, they are, but because of the characters the, fan, the actual lore and everything. These doujin games that blew up and gained traction outside of Japan, they, have, they sit in a weird middle ground between Japanese people take it for granted and are really into it, and this is all we know, most of us, about Japanese PC games. So it kind of, it installs itself as the forebearer of all these things. 
I guess that's why I would think it would be most, accept, most well known. Just behind that though, you have Falcom's East games, the Trails games, you have Koei's Nobunaga's Ambition, you have other games that you don't normally associate with Japanese PCs because they got console ports. Uh, who else? You, sir. When I was first introduced to the MSX, the sort of thinking on it was, this definitely does not involve Microsoft. And then later on, it was, okay, this definitely does involve Microsoft. Do you know how that ignorance sort of came into the mm. discussion around the MSX? So in regards to how Microsoft is both well known for MSX and not well known for MSX, or doesn't seem like a factor, the truth is they didn't have a lot of involvement outside of providing BASIC, Microsoft BASIC, and working on the platform with Nishi and ASCII to make it viable for the manufacturers. It, the MSX platform grew to have a life and a universe out well beyond that because of developers like Compile, t and &E Soft, because of homebrew developers working in the Netherlands and Japan over here as well to make their own you know, bottom-up creations. Microsoft, it doesn't have that kind of soft image of, it's not necessarily associated with all those things. People have a kind of stodgy corporate idea of what Microsoft does, whether it fits or not. Microsoft, for that matter, did eventually split apart with ASCII Corporation to go their own separate ways, especially from Windows. And so it became more ASCII Corporation's thing after a while, but it was always more Nishi's thing. It was also arguably Kojima's thing because the first MSX game people think of is Metal Gear. Which is true, and that kind of that kind of prestige and know-how coming from people who have made it big elsewhere all plays into this. Anyone else want to ask anything specific? Anything just general? You, sir. I'm just looking. Uh, I see you have some some over there on the right. I'm just curious about like resources. Yes. Information about uh, more about this. This is a nice article on Retronauts about the PC-88 series. It's take, worth taking a look at. I felt it got overlooked back in 200, 200, 217, 2017. <laughs> this is a thing that happens. A lot of, a thing that I really wanted to get to is that we have a lot of the history available. We have more primary sources than ever. We have guides and blog articles such as this, which go in depth or at least take a good overview introducing to what this was all like, but they just tend to drop off after a while. It's getting that kind of push towards the top, towards mainstreaming that's important, but also kind of precarious. People might get the wrong impression and start to associate, for example, Japanese PC games with porn games, utterly, or just Toho, or just Metal Gear. And the other link, if I go back to that, oh, there it is is an article on US Gamer about Kotori Yoshimura and Star Cruiser of particular note. Kotori Yoshimura recently got a big Twitter bump from ben Brandon Sheffield, who has helped you know, kind of make her known, you could say. That's a relevant article just for learning more about kind of the culture that she grew up in making PC-88, X1, Sharp X68, Sharp X1 games, and so forth, how that evolved over time. So you can screen cap that. I'm gonna see if I can get the presentation up later, either on my Twitter or up on the guidebook itself. Good. Glad. Does anyone else desperately need to ask a question? Yes. I don't know Japanese yet. I'm working on it. It's a New Year's resolution. Yes. A recommendation, what kind of recommendation? Perhaps some game that you're recently like just struck by. That's, you know, just struck by? Oh yeah. Well, we can just look at this list right here. We got a bunch of great boxes. You can come up to see just in a little bit. And Popful Mail. Okay. Popful Mail yeah. on its platforms, Mega CD, of course, but also PC88, PC98. Very accessible Falcom game. I highly recommend trying really any Falcom game from that period. Some of them are not going to hold up the way you expect. Some of them will hold up better than you expect. For something that's immediately accessible, this right here on PC-88, Final Crisis, is an absurdly well-performing shooter for a machine that cannot do scrolling or sprites. It must be seen to be believed. There's a YouTube video by the Basement Brothers that goes into Final Crisis really well. I will look that up, and for my part, I've done GIFs of this game. I've played through to the end. I cannot get over how good it is as a shooter. It's a very accessible horizontal shooter. 
get into some of the weirder ones, you have relics. Relics, this version, I believe, Dave, what version is this? 88? 88? Relics was a particularly popular game, almost like the Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia, but Japanese, in terms of just its style, its odd, its odd atmosphere, how many unique design choices it made, also its ubiquitous use of English pretty much the entire way through. They were just as confused as we are when we try to play this. And it had a really good set of ports, but it does play best on PC-98, I find. Relics is a particularly influential game. It led to, it directly led to Broderbund asking the publisher, Bothtech, to help them localize Japanese games to DOS. It sold 150,000 copies, which is very good. You can sell 50,000 copies, you could have sold 50,000 back then and been rich. The games were priced that high. I'm getting on a tangent. Point is, that game's great, that game's great. East is great, of course. Final Crisis, yes. Uh, the Scheme, which has music by Yuzo Koshiro, also very good. For my part, I recently found myself playing a lot of Revival Xanadu on PC-98 as well. I could go on. Point is, does anyone have any other questions? It can be something really innocuous. Sure, back there. Kotori Yoshimura is something of a standout. There were some women programmers back in that time, but they went, of course, as fits the international trends rather under the radar. It was a very male-dominated industry, working, on Jap working as a Japanese PC developer, or even just covering the games and publish working to publish them. And she herself struggled with years of dysphoria before finally asserting herself, as the slide says. And I can imagine some of that is due to, well, it was a sausage fest, and it was also a matter of, in Japan, being that upfront and frank about yourself can be off-putting to others. If you're a business person, such as her, trying to get your game sold in stores, you have to start repressing some of yourself. Yeah. Do you think that might just be, like, do you think PC gaming might have, I don't know, do your research, like, might have been, Right. He's asking if there would have been more of a market for as games by female programmers or other outsiders had conditions in the market been different, conditions in Japanese business customs. Right. She did go on to work on things such as direct to the metal coding for Pentium 4, working on the MPEG-4 codec. She has had a lot of contract work and things that really are important. They're just not, they don't have a super unique name attached to them. And so a lot of people who do contract work often fit that outsider category, often just out of necessity. They don't get the superstar positions. A lot of reasons can contribute to that and they're all worth researching. Actually, uh, you knew me, Tracy saw earlier, here. She did make me and one of the things that she said was Capcom Sound Music staff was very interesting in that it was mostly female as opposed to other companies where it was mostly male. Right. So if you look at Capcom's history, all your Mega Man games and stuff, mostly female. That's true, and there are outliers like that, both for, for console games, for arcade games, and for microcomputer examples as well. All right, and I'm still taking questions. But it is getting pretty late. Anyone any last, la any last minute questions? Anyone just want to come right up? We'll do a repeat. Why not? Oh, we have a question? Yeah. I guess we can call it quits then. Well, let's go see the games, guys. Thank you.